Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ken Yalowitz. I'm the director of the Dickey Center. And I'd like to uh, formally welcome you to what is actually our last major public event of this academic year. And it's also uh, our last Great Issues uh, lecture uh, of this year. I think uh, most of you know that we established the Great Issues lecture series uh, in memory and in honor of John Sloan Dickey and also in part a reflection of the Great Issues course uh, that he initiated here in Dartmouth and went on for many, many years. Um, we hold the Great Issues lecture, um, I used to say once every term, but we've just had two this particular week, so I would have to say uh, at least once every term. And it's devoted to uh, one of the great issues uh, of the day. And uh, we're very, very honored today to have uh, Ambassador Mary Simon with us. And uh, she will be introduced uh, in just a moment. But again, I want to thank you for coming indoors on this first sort of summer evening uh, in Hanover. And I think you will be well rewarded uh, for, for being here. But I would like now uh, to introduce Professor Marianne Stenbeck uh, from McGill University in Canada. Marianne has been uh, with the Dickey Center since the beginning of this year as a Dickey Center visiting fellow. She's a professor of English at McGill, but I think that's kind of a, a sham title because she really is a very expert person uh, on all kinds of issues of the North. Uh, climate change, global warming, uh, indigenous peoples, cultures. She's been a tremendous asset uh, to the Dickey Center and to Dartmouth during her time here, uh, including some very, very valuable work and very much appreciated work uh, that she did in helping us prepare for the Arctic Science Summit Week, uh, a major meeting here that took place at Dartmouth uh, in which we hosted about 250 <laughs> Uh, of the leading Arctic scientists, policymakers, and representatives of native peoples. And um, Marianne has known um, uh, Ambassador Simon for many, many years, and uh, I'm delighted to turn the floor over to her now to uh, carry on. Marianne. Thank you very much. Yes, it is indeed a pleasure to introduce Mary Simon. Uh, a really remarkable woman. She was born in, I have tried all afternoon to learn to say this, but Kangnisua hmm? uh, Lutuak in northern uh, Quebec. It, but she was born actually in a tent out on the land, out on the tundra, and she lived on the land until she was six years old. And she didn't even speak English at that time. Now, of course, she does. But it was here while she lived on the land that she really learned the foundations of her future uh, work. Uh, from her beloved grandmother, she heard the stories and the legends of her peoples. Uh, from her beloved mother, Nancy, she learned the love of the family and of the Inuit. And from her father, Bob, she learned about the Arctic, its riches, and about hard work, I think. They inspired in her the passion and dedication that she has brought to all her work since, and her work uh, honors those three people. Let me mention just some of her accomplishments, because in fact there are so many, it's hard to sort of pick and, and choose. But she certainly has devoted her life to gaining greater recognition, not just for the Inuit in Canada, but for all Aboriginal people in Canada and in the circumpolar uh, world. She began her career with the CBC radio service as a producer and announcer. If I remember correctly, you actually did a cooking show, I think, at one point. <laughs> but we'll try to forget that. She was subsequently elected secretary of the board of directors of the Northern Quebec Inuit Association from 76 to 78. And then after she was elected vice president and then president of the Makovic Corporation, which is a, a really the political economic organization of the Inuit in northern Quebec, a, a very powerful and, and influential position. 
For 14 years, from 1980 to 94, she served as an executive council member and then as president of the Inuit Circumpolar Conference, which is the international uh, organization for all the world's Inuit and an organization that has received NGO status at the UN. Uh, Mary Simon was one of the senior Inuit negotiators during the repatriation of the Canadian Constitution as well as with the First Minister's meetings in Canada during the early 80s. And these meetings and the repatriation of the Constitution helped reshape the future of Canadian Aboriginal uh, people. When she sat as an executive council member at the ICC, she was instrumental in getting the Ru uh, Russian Inuit out of Chukotka and to actually get them to sit uh, at the table with the ICC. This is a major, major accomplishment and was really very good for the Chukotkan Inuit. Uh, in 1994, she was appointed by the Prime Minister of Canada to be the first Canadian uh, Ambassador of Circumpolar Affairs, and she served in that capacity for nine years. During this time, she was instructed by the Government of Canada to help establish the Arctic Council, which is a council of the eight Arctic countries, and she in fact served as chair. Concurrently for uh, two years, she was also the Canadian ambassador to um, Denmark. She has since then, or concurrently also, she served as chancellor of Trent University because promoting northern science has also been uh, a cause dear to her heart. And she was elected to a present uh, position as president of the Inuit Taparit Kanatami, the national Inuit organization in Canada in uh, 2006. She has received many, many orders, uh, sorry, not orders, but honors, including some orders. Uh, she's been uh, awarded the Order of Canada and was recently promoted. There are three levels. Uh, to Companion of the Order of Canada, and you will see it in her lapel. She furthermore has received the National Order of Quebec, the Gold uh, Nasornat Order of Greenland, the National Aboriginal Achievement Award, and I, I could go on. She has received three honorary doctorates. I was very happy to be able to present her with the first one at McGill University. Since then, she has had honorary doctors from Queen's University and Trent, which are also uh, Canadian universities. She has really gained the respect and admiration of many heads of government and international organizations through her diplomacy and firmness of uh, purpose. A few weeks ago, a Canadian newspaper described her as the foremost Aboriginal diplomat in Canada, and indeed she is. The Dickey Centre is very proud to welcome you, Mary Simon. Thank you very much, Marianne, for your very kind, uh, too kind introduction. Um, but I, I really appreciate the, uh, the words that you have spoken. And uh, before I begin, I, I would like to, uh, to thank uh, uh, you for inviting me to address uh, this uh, uh, audience as part of the Great Speaker Series. Um, I'm delighted to be here, and it is indeed an honor and I particularly um, would like to th thank uh, Ambassador Yalowitz, who founded these series. Um, and I, I have to confess that uh, that I did look up the series on your on your website and thought it would be appropriate to uh, quote something that you have said, Mr. Yalowitz. You said, "I feel very strongly that no Dartmouth student should leave here." without a strong recognition and understanding of international issues and a commitment to do something about them, to be active and involved. And uh, I, I couldn't agree with you more, and uh, this is precisely 
uh, what, uh, what I want to explore with, uh, with everybody this evening. And um, before I get into sort of the substantive uh, issues, I'd like to spend a few minutes uh, telling you about uh, the organization that I represent, the uh, Inuit Tepurit Kanatami, and a little bit about my personal history so that uh, uh, hopefully uh, this will help uh, set, sort of set the backdrop for our, uh, for our discussion this evening and, uh, and also how Inuit have, uh, have contributed to the development of Arctic policy, which is really um, the issue that, that I will be uh, talking about. Uh, Inuit Tapirik Kanatami, which is more commonly known as ITK, we, we never say Inuit Tapirit Kanatami, we always say ITK, uh, represents uh, Canada's Inuit, uh, as Marianne said, of uh, matters of, of national concern. And uh, there are approximately uh, 53,000 Inuit living in 53 communities across the Canadian Arctic. Uh, the Inuit territory of Canada is actually divided into four, four main regions or four distinct regions. And um, uh, Nunavut, uh, as a territory, is further divided into uh, to four regions, which is the Khitikmiut region, the Kivarlik region, and the Khikiktalik region, or actually three regions. And then we have uh, uh, the Western Arctic, which is called Nunakput by the Inuvialuit uh, that live in that region. And the region I come from in northern Quebec is called Nunavik. And also in Labrador, um, the Inuit call it Nunatsiavut, which is uh, the Inuit ho homeland in, in northern Labrador. Um, Inuit, ITK is the national voice of Canada, and it addresses issues of vital importance to the preservation of, uh, of Inuit identity, culture, and way of life. And one of the most important responsibility of ITK is, is to promote Inuit rights. Uh, we work to ensure that Inuit are properly informed about issues and events that affect their lives. Uh, that's a big part of our role. And we also seek to ensure that, uh, that different processes that purport to address Inuit interests are properly informed by Inuit knowledge and their perspectives and their vision. So this is a lot of the work that we do as a national organization. Um, all of our regions that I, I, I just spoke about have achieved what we call comprehensive uh, land claims agreements. And these include the James Bay and Northern Quebec Agreement, the Inuvialuit Final Agreement, the Nunavut Land Claims Agreement, and the Labrador Inuit Land Claims Agreement. And at the moment, uh, Nunavik, which is the region I come from, we are in the process of uh, ratifying a new agreement which deals with the offshore of, uh, the, of the region um, in terms of the Angava coast and the east coast of, of Hudson's Bay. And uh, we're just awaiting the passage of the ratification uh, legislation by the Parliament of Canada. You know, we're hoping that this will this will be done uh, before Parliament prorogues for, for the summer. And this will actually complete the, uh, the treaty landscape uh, for Canadian Inuit. Um, these agreements are, are uh, constitutionally protected by virtue of uh, Section 35 of the Constitution Act of 1982. That's when, uh, when Marianne was talking about uh, my involvement in the constitutional development. It was during that time that um, we were able to secure sort of a basic recognition of our, of our rights of, as uh, Aboriginal people in Canada. So that's sort of, uh, in, in a nutshell, what, uh, what ITK uh, is about. Um, and then a little bit about myself. Marianne has already uh, talked about uh, my work uh, to some extent. Uh, but um, I just want to say that I, I was born on the Angaba coast in a very small community known as Kangatsualudra. Oh. Yeah, close. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which actually means in English a very large bay. <laughs> and uh, my father, my mother is Inuit and my father is a non-native. Non 
Uh, my father was uh, the Hudson's Bay Company. He was a fur trader for the Hudson's Bay Company, and that's how he, he went into the Arctic at a very early age, actually when he was about 18 years old. And he's still there. He's uh, 90 years old now. <laughs> um, and, I, and, I, and, and my father really adopted uh, my, mother's, uh, my mother's culture. My mother was uh, not an academically educated individual, um, and she was unilingual. She didn't speak any English, so we always spoke, uh, spoke Inuktitut at home, uh, which my father was very fluent in. And uh, I spent uh, my early years um, living a very traditional uh, life. And, uh, and that's why I have very strong bonds with life on the land, and and I uh, and I and that's really what gives me the the kind of vision that I need to to advocate uh, for the interests of the Arctic and our people. Um, but at the same time, my father, who was you know very committed to to the north, he provided me and my brothers and sisters with whatever opportunities were available at the time to be educated in English and to be able to, to, to continue our education outside of, outside of the territory. And in fact, uh, I went to school uh, partly in the United States, in Colorado, Colorado Springs, because that's where my father's family came from Manitoba but they immigrated to the States. when, Just as he was moving into the Arctic, they were immigrating to the States. So my father never actually lived in the States, but his, uh, his family is now, you know, um, is now Americans. And I think these, uh, these different situations have really influenced um, how, I, uh, how I do my work in terms of the development that has gone on, not only in my region, but um, in northern Canada, as well as uh, in the circumpolar region. And uh, I hate to date myself, but I've been involved in northern politics for about 35 years now, so that is, uh, that is quite a long time. Um, so, you know, these, these different uh, situations have, uh, have allowed me to, to grow, not only as an individual, as, but as a leader. And, uh, uh, rather than go through a lot of the different things that I've done, because Marianne has already uh, has already uh, talked about that, um, I just perhaps will now skip to um, more of uh, ITK's mandate, which is uh, more of a domestic national mandate, and uh, how we use our work to influence. Uh, and continue to participate and work in a variety of, in, in, of international uh, institutions and initiatives that support, um, in support of, indi of, uh, of indigenous rights uh, and issues. And, um, you know, the question we always ask ourselves is, uh, you know, um, have we and do we continue to make a difference? You know, we always have to ask that question because sometimes it seems like we are not making a difference. Uh, but I believe, looking back over the last 35 years uh, in my own work, I think, uh, I think we have made a difference. And let me tell you why, by providing some, some concrete examples, uh, like I said, based on my, uh, my own experience and, and, and linking international work uh, with domestic progress. Um, uh, so let's look at uh, let's look at environmental uh, matters uh, as an example. Uh, about as recently as 25 years ago, the Arctic regions were hardly on the on the political environmental agenda. In fact, quite the opposite was true. Resource development proposals were the focus, and land claims uh, still in their infancy. Uh, so um, that was back then, but today the Arctic is often at the center of the agenda. And, uh, you know, how did that happen? Um, I believe that uh, the turning point was uh, in 1987 when um, the 1987 Brundtland Commission uh, report came out, uh, Sustainable Development uh, 
became an international rallying cry, replacing uh, what many consider to be the negative connotations surrounding the term environmental protection. Uh, and northern leaders, including myself, uh, we seized this opportunity to make the critical link uh, between environmental integrity and the rights of the Arctic's indigenous peoples. We threw ourselves into the work of educating public opinion at home and abroad and of influencing international processes to address Arctic issues. In the early 1990s, we began to lobby for cooperative global and regional protection efforts uh, through what came to be known as the Roma, Rovaniemi process. I'm sure some of you are familiar with that. Uh, Canada and its uh, Arctic neighbors uh, developed the Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy, which is uh, more commonly known as the AEPS uh, in 1991. Uh, the participation of uh, northern indigenous organizations, which included the Inuit Circumpolar Conference and the, uh, uh, the Nordic Sami Council, and later the Russian Indigenous Peoples Organization. Um, in these uh, and these um, international efforts were instrumental in advancing issues such as uh, the human health impacts of transboundary contaminants, like pollutants that come into the Arctic from other regions of the world. And because the Arctic is, is a cold, cold climate, it acts as a sink for these pollutants. And these pollutants then get into, into, the, into the food chain, like the, uh, the, the wildlife and, and the marine mammals, which our people depend on. And it's being transferred into humans. And that was one of the things that um, that we really uh, were very worried about. And uh, during this same period, uh, we put uh, considerable effort into and I guess achieved some success uh, ensuring that in indigenous people were well situated in Agenda 21, uh, which was another phase of, of, of that work. Um, the action plan, uh, resulting, the, the Agenda 21 was an action plan that resulted from the, uh, from the 1992 United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, and also the Associated uh, Convention on Biological Diversity. And then from that process, the Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy, um, we started to uh, work very uh, actively on the emergence of the Arctic Council because there was a feeling uh, that uh, that environmental protection wasn't broad enough in terms of addressing issues that were affecting the Arctic and its people. So the uh, Arctic Council was uh, was created, and and the Arctic Council, as some of you may know, is a high level. Uh, high-level intergovernmental forum, which is comprised of the, of the eight Arctic states, uh, including Canada, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, Russia, Sweden, and the United States. And uh, as well, there are um, what we call permanent participants. They, they are the indigenous uh, peoples organizations that, uh, that are part of the Arctic Council, and there's six of those international organizations that are participating in the Council. And the Arctic Council provides a mechanism uh, to address the common, and con uh, common concerns and, and challenges faced by Arctic governments, as well as the people of the Arctic. I mean, that was one of the big, big issues that we were confronting, that we wanted the people that were being affected by development, that were being affected by changes in the Arctic, to be involved in these processes where there was discussion on how to either manage those issues or how to uh, alleviate the pressures that people were feeling. We just felt that uh, this had to be done through, uh, through the, with the involvement of, of, the, uh, of the indigenous people in the Arctic. Now there are, you know, there's always, um, um, issues related to how effective the Arctic Council actually is, but it is the first time in an international setting or in, 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 in an international organization where indigenous people actually have an active role. 
they're not just observers. They actually participate in the discussions and engage with Arctic states. And even though it has shortcomings in this present day, uh, it could eventually be improved so that it becomes much more effective in terms of addressing um, issues that are, are, are affecting people in the North. So, you know, it's all, I think, the expectations of, of people was that the Arctic Council be a very influential organization right from the beginning was something that we couldn't achieve at the time because there was a lot of reluctance on the part of Arctic states not to even <laughs> agree on an international forum like the Arctic Council. So it was a, a, a really hard fought battle amongst the Arctic nations just to get to where we are today. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a foundation that could be worked on and built upon in, in the future. And especially um, with the fact that, uh, that indigenous people do have a role and a recognized role both in the, uh, the declaration that founded the Arctic Council as well as in the, uh, the many working groups that the Arctic Council uh, has. Um, uh, for example, in the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment uh, Program, there's a lot of uh, cooperative research uh, being undertaken by, by this particular working group, and it uh, deals with uh, the effects of pollution on the environment. And also, it also deals with the effects of pollution on people. So I think substantial uh, science work as well as the role of indigenous people is very important. And we were talking about this earlier today, where how do we bring Western science uh, along in a way, and how do we bring traditional knowledge along in a way where the both of them will start working together so that you legitimize not only the, the Western science, but you also leg legitimize the indigenous knowledge that is uh, very valuable in terms of identifying how to resolve some of the issues that we're, uh, that we're facing uh, in relation to the environment in the Arctic. Um, so one of the things that we've done in Canada, uh, which is part of this, this international process that I'm, that I'm uh, talking about, is that uh, the federal government in Canada sponsored what we call the Northern Contaminants Program, which ITK is involved in. And we're a very active partner in, in that. And what the uh, Northern Contaminants Program does is, is uh, it takes the, um, the information that is, that is uh, laid out by scientists and the evidence that is laid out by scientists that is always very fairly technical and it's not uh, always done in, in sort of a layman's language that people at the community level really don't understand <laughs> what the results are, are about. We take that information and we try and, and um, explain the results in a, in a way that people can understand so that people start to realize that there is information there for them to make more informed choices about their own food source, about the level of contaminants that are in the, uh, in the animals, such as caribou or certain types of fish or uh, seals or beluga, that they, they, um, that they have that kind of information to, to, to uh, decide whether they want to, to, to uh, continue eating a certain type of uh, wildlife. Like for instance, when right now, when uh, women are, are pregnant, there are certain types of wildlife and also seal blubber where they're told by the medical authorities not to eat seal blubber or uh, caribou liver for the first three months of their pregnancy. That's just an example of what I mean by informed choices. I mean, the person has the right to decide for themselves, but at least they're getting that information and they can make that choice. Uh, so this is very important. Uh, this is very important for our communities. Um, so these are some of the things that 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 sort of filter back at, into the into the into the communities, because I know that you know a lot of our people back home 
uh, when we're talking about international work, they look at you like, so what does it matter to us? Because <laughs> it doesn't affect them on a day-to-day -day basis. So you have to, in the long, you know, you have to try and explain it in a way that, that the long-term implications is really what we're working on. And uh, I think people are, are starting to, to realize that more and more. So, you know, now, nowadays, um, Hardly a day's go by, hardly a day goes by without uh, a new st a new story on the Arctic environment, uh, be it at the scale of the let's say the proposed Mackenzie Valley pipeline or how an experienced uh, hunter in an isolated community on Baffin Island no longer feels safe on the sea ice, um, and you know I hope you don't misunderstand me because I'm not arguing that increased international awareness and focused research alone constitute a complete solution. Far from it, um, but I am convinced that uh, efforts many of us, uh, that many of us have made at the international level in bringing Arctic issues to the attention of the world have been worth it because I think um, um, you know, knowledge in itself is not a sufficient problem solver um, in the absence of, of political engagement and the, and the commitment of, uh, of creative energy and public and private sector resources, but it, it is a necessary first step. So, the, you know, this, this all, um, uh, you know, let's take climate change uh, as, as an example. Uh, the Arctic is uh, becoming... Um, is fast becoming uh, the lightning rod for why action uh, to reduce uh, greenhouse gas, uh, gas emissions is urgent. Uh, a recent UN panel report uh, based on an overwhelming uh, scientific consensus reveals uh, that the Arctic ice is melting three times faster than models um, had earlier predicted. And the earlier predictions, I thought, were alarming enough. So now they're saying it's, that's, it's three times worse than that. Um, um, so our work uh, in shaping policy in, in the circumpolar region and domestically through such policy frameworks as the Northern Dimension of Canada's foreign policy set us up to be players, I think, in the climate change debate. In a very, um, in a very uh, um, active way, um, because you know uh, we are pulling out all the stops, mindful that only a limited number uh, are in our hands. Really, um, um, on the domestic front, uh, ITK has been very active in uh, pursuing an aggressive response to climate change. Uh, Inuit recognize the need to work. Uh, at all levels of government and society on global warming, abatement, and mitigation. Uh, ITK is promoting uh, the development of a national uh, climate change strategy, a government of Canada and Inuit partnership, an Inuit climate change action plan as part of this strategy will be needed to ensure that we are involved and that there is a national focus on the Arctic. Right now, there doesn't seem to be a focus on the Arctic. So we are very working very hard to try and bring that, uh, bring that Arctic focus uh, into, into the climate change discussion. Um, I just want to share with you a little bit about uh, some of the key recommendations that we've made to the government of Canada. Uh, we've uh, recommended that they convene a blue ribbon panel on climate change with civil society and industry leaders. This panel would be innovative, nonpartisan, and share the burden of responsibility. We need that kind of a, a, of a forum and a debate within our country. We want to see an, a, the appointment of a climate change auditor uh, to re-examine all federal legislation in the face of climate change impacts. We, need, we are asking for a comprehensive national co climate change strategy with targets, timelines, benchmarks, 
connections to international processes, expenditure commitments, tax and incentive measures, mechanisms with territories, provinces and Aboriginal peoples, and impact abatement measures, mitigation measure, measures, and adaptation measures. Adaptation measures is very critical for us because we were talking earlier, I think, at dinner, uh, that uh, even if they, if they shut all the to taps down today or tomorrow, uh, climate change is going to escalate for quite a number of years before you start to see any kind of change. So our communities are already experiencing some severe impacts. Uh, for instance, um, in some of the more remote regions of the Canadian Arctic, uh, communities, we are all coastal communities. And in some of the communities where the permafrost has, uh, has melted, the houses are slowly, you know, like sort of shifting in terms of, uh, of where the house stands. And if they're too close to the shore of, of the bay or the ocean, uh, because of the severity of some of these storms, uh, the ocean is starting to come into people's backyards. And people can't afford to move their homes and people can't afford to build n new houses. So they're, you know, they're stuck uh, in terms of a, a very bad situation where, and we need the assistance of the government to, to address these issues now, not like 10 years from now. Uh, and that's why adaptation uh, measures is, um, is a very, very critical part of of our work. Uh, mitigation is also important, but mitigation becomes uh, more of uh, a, a process where if you can, you know, change the way things are happening, then mitigation makes a lot of sense. But if you can't change the way things are happening, then adaptation makes more sense to our communities. People don't want to change the way they live their traditional lives, but some, there are some in some areas, there are no, no choices. That you have to really make uh, very um, serious choices about how life is lived in some of our communities. Uh, we're also asking the government to select um, an Inuit community as a model Arctic climate change community, um, which would address uh, uh, building and engineering challenges and opportunities in innovative ways that respect the culture and the cultural design, the environmental stewardship, and and how you build a sustainable uh, how you build sustainable communities. Because if we can be successful in a community as a model community, then we can start to transfer that those adaptation mes measures into other communities. So that it's all it's not you know we're not trying to do things all at once but we are actually looking at the, you know, the successes and failures of how a community can adapt to climate change. Um, so the, these are some of the, um, some of the efforts that, uh, that ITK, ITK is, uh, is working on. Uh, Canada is already, uh, I think, already experiencing uh, the, the economic consequences of, uh, of climate change and the stakes will only get bigger in the future. I mean, they're getting bigger every day in the Arctic. Um, Sir Nicholas Stern, which some of you probably have heard about, who was the former chief economist at the World Bank and an author of the uh, wild, wildly recognized report on the economic impacts of climate change, uh, recently addressed uh, the Econo Economic Club of Toronto. And uh, in that uh, address, uh, he warned the cure is less painful than the disease. If we ignore the problem of climate change, it is growth and living standards that will suffer. And I think that is, that is so accurate. It's, uh, it's very true in the north, in, in the Arctic regions. Now, um, I guess my appeal to, to you, to the people who inhabit uh, the world of scholarship and learning, uh, academics and academic institutions have a very important role to play uh, in assisting vulnerable groups, such as uh, indigenous peoples of the Arctic, to understand, um, 
confront and develop solutions in the face of life-altering threats posed by global warming and climate change. And I've talked a little bit about some of those. There's many more examples that, uh, that I could talk about. Uh, the recent uh, Arctic uh, Climate Impact Assessment Report, which the Arctic Council uh, produced over many years of, of very important research, um, provides, I think, an excellent example. This report was prepared, uh, like I said, under the auspices of the Arctic Council, and it evaluates and synthesizes knowledge on climate variability and change in support of policy-making processes and the work of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It also addresses environmental, human health, social, cultural, and economic impacts and consequences. And, uh, you know, there was, I think, a team of more than uh, than 300 uh, leading Arctic uh, researchers and also indigenous representatives, and that's where I think, uh, you know, this report has been very, um, I think, credible in many ways because it did bring indigenous uh, representatives from many countries uh, to participate. In fact, from 15 countries, actually 15 countries collaborated on this, on this report. It wasn't just the Arctic Council states, but 15 countries. Uh, and over 160 independent scientists re reviewed the final draft. So there was um, uh, extensive involvement. Uh, it, was a, it was really a huge effort. Uh, and I think it is a, remarka uh, a remarkable example of the interface between science and public policy. Many of the key contributors were scientists with a keen sense of public responsibility and moral purpose. Arctic peoples and their representative organizations, they really need your help. Like, we really uh, do rely on the, on the academic community to help us bring these to the forefront. In both the domestic and international forum, there is, a, uh, I think, a price uh, of entry into larger public policy debates often that price of entry is scientific credibility. And uh, we need that credibility in terms of what's happening. Um, our efforts to push our governments to take action on climate change have to be backed by more than passion and arguments about moral obligations. Uh, academic institutions such as Dartmouth, with your long St uh, long tradition of Arctic work in a variety of disciplines can do an enormous amount to promote, indeed to insist on, sound public policy making, both in domestic and international arena. And that's why I was so uh, glad when I got your invitation to come here. Uh, and I'll give you a few examples. Um, open houses can be organized around issues connected to climate change in the Arctic where members of the community can participate. And I think we, that's one of the things that we were talking about earlier. Uh, special seminars can be organized to, to, mo to further motivate students uh, to pursue research on Arctic issues. Working with indigenous organizations, multidisciplinary research programs aimed at developing policy recommendations in support of indigenous peoples in the Arctic can be mounted. Uh, scholars can insist on maximum transparency and sharing of fast-moving and cross-fertilizing research projects and results. And a key message uh, of the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment Report is that climate change is, above all else, a human and, and cultural issue. Yet these perspectives are easily lost when bureaucrats in their thousands get together every year to negotiate policies, programs, targets, and emission trading schemes under the United Nations Framework Conve Convention on Climate Change. What is happening in the Arctic now and projected into the new and longer term futures is already affecting the way we live. These impacts will no longer 
they will no longer doubt mount, they will increase. Adapting to climate change will be difficult, not just for Northerners, but for everybody. The survival of uh, Inuit as a hunting culture and as a distinct people is at stake, raising international important questions of human rights and env environmental security. Unity of will and harnessing of our collective resources and intelligence is our best, indeed, only hope. So in, in, so in friendship and great respect, we seek your partnership, and I thank you for, for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Thank you. We need more women. <laughs> no, I, I often find that um, gender balance is very important in many areas, and I think climate change is, is really uh, one of those areas where um, it's not just about the changing environment, but it's about changing people's lives. And women in the North tend to be very involved at the community level, and they, they deal with, uh, uh, you know, they are the ones that, that are dealing with uh, children and youth in many situations. They are the ones that are dealing with a lot of the health issues that uh, are affecting uh, people at the community level. So ha they have a very intimate knowledge of, of some of the changes that, that really our hunters talk about, the visual aspects of what our hunters are seeing is often being felt at, in, the home, in the home as well, because if, if, a, if a hunter can't come home with um, their catch or their uh, caribou or their uh, seal, then the family is going to suffer to some extent in terms of having a very uh, nutritional uh, diet, a balanced diet. So women have a very, I think, unique contribution to make to the discussions on climate change. And I'm just talking about the Arctic, but I think it, it carries through to other cultures as well. So I'd like to see more women involved in, uh, in not just climate change discussions, but uh, in the political evolution of our, of our own um, systems and societies. Like we have a new uh, a territory in Canada called Nunavut. And um, all the members of parliament, uh, except for two people, are men. And what people say a lot of times is that in the parliament, the discussions don't often go far enough in terms of what's happening at the community level, like the social programs, the educational programs. You know, those types of discussions don't always happen because the men aren't as involved in those issues as women are at the community level. I don't know if it's like that in other cultures, but in the Inuit culture, that is really how it has evolved. We don't know. <laughs> we, I had a meeting with the Minister of Environment about three weeks ago, and I presented all our proposals to him. And 
we're still waiting for an official response. So we don't know if our recommendations are going to form a part of their agenda or not. So, you know, it's, I can't really answer your question right now. Um, you gave the example that in some communities, um, or some communities face a problem that the houses are built close to the uh, coast and that you have problems with melting permafrost and erosion and that houses kind of get destroyed. Um, a very easy solution would be to build the house further inland. But what I would like to ask you, what else do we need to know in order to really as assess the problem? Is it really just a material loss? And you can find a solution by just building another house? Or what does a house mean to people? What does it, you know, what else is involved in that type of problem? Why is the solution so complicated problem? Well, it's, it's that, that one house may be affected, but it's really the whole community that you're talking about because a lot of the Inuit communities are, are traditionally built around the traditional lands of, of the Inuit, where we, you know, when we, Inuit, we were normally very nomadic people, where I remember my grandmother, she never really lived in a community until after us uh, children were old enough to have to go to school. Uh, so they were very nomadic. So when the government decided that Inuit had to live in, in uh, settlements so that the children could go to school, um, generally the community was built around the traditional uh, lands that people, where people hunted at different times of the year. So it was always on the coast, along the coast. And the closer to the water, the better, because part of our tradition is that the sea ice is part of our, our uh, land. That's where people hunt all winter. Um, so when homes start to be affected in the way that I was talking about, it is the whole community that you're talking about. But because many of the homes are built along the coast, it's not like you're building you know, two or three houses along the shore, and then the rest are like back inland, um, many of the homes are built along the coast. So, you know, this is, uh, this is very much a, um, a community issue rather than an individual issue. It's, it, it happens anyway to a certain extent. Uh, it's not always due to climate change necessarily, but it has to do with uh, individuals that want to try and find more opportunities like jobs and, and maybe better education because a lot of the remote communities don't have access to jobs and they don't have access to better education. Um, so there is a certain movement that na happens naturally, um, and there are more and more Inuit uh, living in, uh, in cities like um, in Montreal, in uh, Ottawa, in Winnipeg, Edmonton, uh, and there's some problems with, uh, with that whole movement because uh, what we find is that uh, there are certainly exceptions to the rule, but generally speaking, when people move from their community, it's very different. It's very different living in a small community than living in an urban setting like Montreal. And if a person isn't prepared for that change, um, and the person is also not, uh, like, doesn't have a, a high school degree or diploma or no, nobody really has a university degree, except maybe for a handful uh, in the Canadian Arctic. Um, they're not ready for that for that change, and they, what they find is that they can't, when they go down, they can't compete with the job. Even if there's lots of jobs, they can't get the jobs. So it, be, it becomes a, like a, a vicious circle where people start to drink, people start to get into trouble and then they don't have family support around them to get them out of their situation. 
and they end up living on the streets. So it's a, like a vicious circle. And then people end up not being able to get back home. Uh, and this happens on numerous occasions where we have uh, quite a number of people that are homeless in the cities. And then they get used to that, you know, used to that uh, sort of cycle. And uh, they don't want to go back home. Um, so people have to learn that if when you move to an urban setting, you have to be very prepared to, to change the way you live. Because it's not like living in any new community at all. You know, you have to, the lifestyles are different, the culture is different, the language is different. Um, and people think it's a great opportunity. In fact, in most cases, it's not. Unless the person is moving for a job. Like we do have lots of people that work in Montreal and in Ottawa and in other cities, but they're working for major organizations like Makovic has their, uh, one, of their main, uh, one of their offices, main offices in, Auto in Montreal, and our, our school board has uh, their head office in, in Montreal. So people that work in those organizations are doing well because they have a job, they have an income, and they, they, they know what to expect when they, when they move. And generally they're, you know, they're more sort of exposed to sort of the world community or the sort of the national scene than somebody that would just get on a plane and say, I'm going to change my life. And when they get there, they can't really make those changes. So it's, you know, it's a difficult, uh, difficult issue. Two questions, and they're really quite different. One is, uh, at the local community level, what's the communication mechanism or way of discourse about the phenomenon of global warming and, and how it's taking place? Well, we, in the Canadian Arctic, we have a very good um, system in place. We have uh, a national um, television network uh, for all Aboriginal peoples across Canada that airs a lot of different types of programming. Uh, in uh, different languages. Uh, we also have in the Canadian Arctic uh, this Canadian Broadcasting Corporation which broadcasts a lot of different radio programs in the Inuit language so people are able to listen to, to uh, uh, news stories, they listen to the national news in their language and uh, you know, regional reports. So there's a lot of sort of information going into the communities. And we also have um, local radio stations that broadcast completely in the Inuit language. So there's a real promotion of the language, especially in the Eastern Arctic. So that's the form of communication. The radio and television are ubiquitous, so that's everywhere in terms of... Oh yeah, it's everywhere, yeah. It has a, television has its bad, uh, <laughs> bad side to it as well. And the second question is, what's the religion, spiritual, cultural uh, link you know, in the in the community? Uh, well, it, it has evolved. It has changed dramatically over decades. Originally, Inuit had their own sort of religion or spirituality, which was not really based on Christianity. Um, but when the when Christianity was introduced to the to the north, into at least I'm going to talk about my uh, the Canadian Arctic, because it's the area that I'm most familiar with. Um, it was evil to practice your own. Uh, spiritual beliefs because you had to really and my grandmother used to tell me these stories so uh, I, I know firsthand what it was like for them they were not allowed to express their own spirituality it was uh, evil to express your own spirituality and you had to become what they call a Christian um, um, and it was Many religions, like in my region, there's uh, Anglican, Anglican um, uh, religion. There's um, Catholic. 
um, now there's a lot of um, evangel evangelism, evangelic, evangelic, what is it called? Evan evangelical movement going on in, uh, in many of the communities. So it has changed. You know, it changes over time, but our own spiritual beliefs were basically stamped out by Christianity, what was called Christianity. And, um, you sound cynical. Pardon me? You sound a little cynical, but then, and I, I might be comfortable well, with your cynicism. Right? I, well, I, my grandmother used to tell me it was, it was um, oh, I, you know, I'm, I consider myself, a, you know, an Anglican because that's how I was brought up. But my grandmother and well, her people... I was brought, brought up Lutheran, but I'm not sure that I consider myself a Lutheran. <laughs> You know, it, it's a different type. It's a different kind of spirituality altogether. We had shamans. We had uh, doc. You know, we had people that could. They used. To, my grandmother actually told me these things, so I believe her. Where people were able to exercise certain powers in those days over individuals, like when people were sick, the certain spirituality that where people were moved to. But only certain individual possessed it. Like there was only very few people that had that kind of power. Yes, yeah, shamans. Yeah. So, yep. uh, maybe I am cynical. I don't know. <laughs> um, as a woman, any experience in like um, oil or any kind of like No, there is no Inuit communities that rely on oil and gas development as their economy at all. Okay. Yeah. So They're hoping to in the <laughs> Western Arctic, <laughs> you know, with the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline. If they, you know, they're trying to negotiate uh, an agree agreement with the oil industry, as well as the federal government to have, uh, you know, economic uh, partnerships yeah. with the development. But so far, it hasn't happened. Yep. Um, you spoke of uh, an increase in both political and economical interest in the area in the past 25 years. And I guess my question is, what sort of impact has it been a, a positive influence or a negative influence has this increased interest in the area had in the past 25 years? And what sort of impact do you see it having in the next 25 years? I think it, it has had a positive impact on, uh, on the north. Um, because it has provided more opportunities for Inuit in terms of education, in terms of, uh, you know, like we live in, uh, you know, like an industrialized uh, country, so it's, it's good to say that you, you have your traditions and your culture and your language, but you don't need to lose those to be part of modern society, that you can't be sort of locked up in, uh, in history so to speak. You have to be part of, of the evolution of, of, of society in the world. And you, you should be able to take the good and the bad. We haven't been able to take just the good. We've also been impacted by some of the negative uh, effects of development coming to the north. For example, television. You know, Television is a, is, has had a very bad impact on especially our younger generation. People think that you know, young kids that that are in their home communities where there are really no jobs and no real opportunities in terms of the materialistic goods that that we depend on in in the Western society, uh, think that they should be able to get all this stuff as well. So they get very disillusioned. They lose hope, and they, their expectations are not being met. Uh, and that has a lot to do with the influence of of things like television. But it has also had there are certain things that have been positive for, for the North, especially these what we call these comprehensive land claims agreements that we've settled over the last 25 years. And these agreements have helped us to build our own econ economic base 
It has helped us to develop our own education system. Although it's not good enough yet, we have started to build our own education system where we are able to now teach uh, our kids up to grade three in our language. And we have a long way to go yet, but you know, this, sometimes these things take, take a long time. Um, like when my, I'm not saying that, that Inuit di didn't appreciate the way they lived in the past, but a lot of people don't want to go to the past because, for example, my mother almost starved when she was eight years old. They didn't consider themselves poor in any way, but it was the, it was the tradition of the people to live out on the land. They were a hunting society. But sometimes there was no, no food. There were no animals. The, the, the caribou didn't migrate that year, or, or maybe the, something happened. And uh, my mother almost, the family almost starved when my mother was eight years old. And people don't want to go through that. Um, there were epidemics, measles epidemic, the whooping cough epidemic, the, you know, like um, mumps, all those different epidemics, uh, tuberculosis. Um, a lot of people died during those years because there was no medical services. Now we have services and we have, uh, they're not good enough. Like uh, we have a lot of services for physical health. We don't have enough services for mental health. We're going through a crisis in terms of uh, mental wellness in the North right now, especially with our young people. The, the, um, the uh, suicide rate in the, in the Arctic is, in Canada, seven times greater than the rest of Canada. So for us, that is totally unacceptable. But there are reasons behind that. And um, uh, one of them is that we don't have proper services to help people that are in crisis that have depression, that have different um, type of crisis situations that are going on in their lives. We don't have counseling services in most of our communities. When somebody tries to commit suicide, they get sent back home without any help. You know, stuff like that, 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 that people, the expectations of in today's society is such that we want the same standard of living as other Canadians without giving up our culture and our identity, which is basically what we're trying to achieve, you know? So that, that, is, that is the goal in the next 25 years. Would you say that the trend of the past 25 years, and I understand that we're in like an in-between period where some things are, are still being resolved, you're still working for better education. Have you, would you say that the next 25 years looks, looks forward for these people, for the the problems that they're still experiencing now? Definitely, and, and that's why I, I have been working very hard to, uh, to engage young people in the process, because they are the ones that have to, uh, have to take what we have now, which has been built by, by people like myself, our generation, we, we will be retiring in the next 10 years or so, um, or even earlier, <laughs> uh, the, the next group of people are the young people like yourself that have to take on these responsibilities and they, they need to be engaged. And a lot of young people aren't engaged. Um, and there is a couple of generations that are sort of, we call them the lost generations because they were sort of in between the traditional life and the modern life. They didn't know. They, they, you know, the, the elders told them to be this way and the education system told them to be this way. So they did, you know, like they were being pulled in different directions. So now we're saying, at least I work on this, that young people need to take the tools that we have prepared and propel the changes that we have made into the future so that they do have better education, they have better services, but they also have to learn that our culture and our language is very, very important because a lot of our young people don't speak our language anymore. And uh, in different regions, there is an effort to bring it all back, but it's much harder to bring something back once you've lost it. Uh, in fact, it's almost impossible sometimes so the, we're telling our young people that if you can speak the language and you know how to hunt and you know how to live the culture, keep it, don't lose it. 
but you can be part of society at the same time. You can have your car, you can have your snow machine, although it's very hard these days with the cost of gasoline in the north. It's about three times higher. <laughs> the cost of gasoline to run your car or your snow machine is three times higher than it is in Canada, like in southern Canada. So people can't afford to even go hunting sometimes because it's so expensive. So there's definitely a lot of challenges, but um, I think there's, I, I believe, I'm an optimist, so I think there's a great future for our people. The young people are there. They're very, there's a lot of people, young people that are vibrant and working hard to make it work. They're just not too obvious. <laughs> Is there one more question? Yeah. Um, just to clarify something that the civil group was asking earlier, with all of the land negotiations and settlements in the last 25 years, are you saying that none of the land that the Inuit are now responsible for, you know, that they possess, is being drilled on or forested or you're not getting any sorts of mineral or natural rights, you know, monies from this land? Well, what happened was when we settled our land claims agreements, the comprehensive land claims agreements, a part of the deal was to predict the kind of revenue that was going to be generated out of different developments, like for instance in my region it's hydro development. So the compensation package that was, that was reached by the Inuit and the government is based on not only the production of, of the resource itself at the time the negotiations were taking place, but uh, it's, it's presumed to include the future revenues that will come out of that development. So in each of the land claims agreements, a settlement was reached for a lump sum of money, whether it's, you know, equitable to what might happen in the future is, is, is really another question. But there's also um, <coughs> negotiations going on, like with the territorial governments, like with the Northwest <coughs> Territories for the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline, when it does eventually get built, that they will be part of the, the, the partnership where they will get revenues from the development. And the, um, the Inuvialuit, the Inuit that live in the Western Arctic, they're also using their land claims corporation to negotiate a partnership with that with that consortium that's being, uh, you know, put together uh, for that future development. So, up until now, there has not been um, oil and gas drilling on Inuit lands per se, because the deal was all, you know, like in the case of hydro. It, the deal was struck in 1975 to include revenues that may be, uh, may be uh, a, you know, that Hydro-Quebec may be getting now, or the Quebec government or the federal government. So the deals are made in advance. Okay. So there's, you don't really have control over what is how the land is being exploited or used if there was something already pre-existing in that sense. To an extent, You were just given a portion of it or some sort of fee based on what they valued it at. Yeah, in strictly economic terms, that's, that's probably an accurate statement in some situations, but in other situations like in the Western, especially in the Northwest Territories where there's a lot of development going on both for diamond mines and oil and gas, the potential for oil and gas off the Beaufort Sea, um, potential partnerships still, still exist. Uh, and there's uh, what they call benefit impact agreements that have been negotiated with, let's say, the diamond mines, where so people can actually benefit from the development in terms of training and job opportunities. So it, it comes back in other ways not just strictly in terms of revenue sharing. Um, but what was I going to say? Um, I was going to say something else that's it's what, gone. <laughs> what, what happens in the case of, say, oil and gas that have not yet been mapped? Or oh, this, oh, I know what I was going to say, yeah. Well, those, 
please. See, in, in the, for Inuit anyway, I can speak about the Inuit situation, but for other Aboriginal groups, I'm not as familiar with the, their arrangements, but for Inuit, we have what we call exclusively owned lands, mm -hmm. which sort of surround uh, the communities. And if there's any development on those lands, it's, we benefit completely from those, those developments. But it doesn't look like very promising. Uh, in category two lands, we, don't, we have some rights if there is development that takes place on the second category of land, which is sort of more of the outlying area. And then we have the category three lands, which are crown lands. And there, you know, uh, I think the territorial governments can negotiate revenue sharing or, to, or taxation powers related to that development. But one of the things that we do have is it, when you get out of sort of the economic equation and you start looking at the, at the development uh, itself, then we have a role to play in the environmental review process as well as uh, both the environmental and hopefully the social impact review process, because that's what we've been fighting for, is to have more uh, broader scope in terms of the review process, so that it includes not just the environment, but also the social impacts of the development. Uh, like, uh, for an example, in Voises Bay, which is the Labrador uh, iron mine development that's going on, uh, the Labrador Inuit have negotiated what they call impact um, benefit agreements, and those those impact benefit agreements provide for um, opportunities for Inuit that live in the region, and they're and they're negotiated like uh, there's negotiations that go on between the Inuit and the development. Mary, thank you. Just out of curiosity, I know you talked about the difficulties that people have moving to urban areas and whatnot. You personally, if you don't mind divulging it, where do you live? I live in Ottawa. And do you have a home back, you know, in one of the more tribal communities? Yeah. Yeah. My, our family, my whole family lives up in the area. So we have a family home in Kujurak. And I'm just building a house there right now. <laughs> So yeah, we, we go back and forth, but uh, I was fortunate uh, growing up, um, my parents taught us to live in both cultures. So I feel very fortunate that I can sort of transcend both cultures without thinking too much about it, you know, like, it's just the way I was brought up. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.